So, MHA's manga has come to an end. What was that? We're starting an epilogue? That's introducing a new villain? And everyone's gonna get a chapter dedicated to themselves to wrap up the story? And Deku's hair looks stupid? Oh. Okay, let's take that from the top. So, MHA's manga is not over. And not only is MHA's manga not over, it doesn't seem like it's gonna be over for a while. In fact, Horikoshi came out last week and said that the epilogue for MHA is gonna last a while as the story gets back to its title, which is wild. Because basically what Horikoshi is telling us there is, okay, I heard you guys, a lot of you didn't like the League of Villains arc, but what if they were kids back in school again? And that is apparently exactly what the epilogue is. All the things that people disliked about MHA, like Deku having a bunch of meta abilities, the introduction of super high-powered villains, and an underground network of overpowered villains that are all working together in a collaborative effort to topple the entirety of the world, are now gone and now with the introduction of the epilogue it's almost like we're back at the beginning of mha which is a wild thing for an epilogue to be because now not only is the majority of class 1a all back together with aizawa as their homeroom teacher about to tackle an entire year of school but also deku's basically quirkless with only the embers of all for one still residing within him and thus the epilogue has done the exact opposite of what you would expect a standard epilogue to do because instead of closing up the story with uraka and deku turning 30 and getting married and having children or something we're just doing my hero academia again which you know what i won't complain about i was really sad that this manga was gonna be over and now it seems like i have this manga until 2025 because in a move i have legitimately never seen before the first chapter of the monologue set up storylines two of them to be exact maybe three the epilogue might have a villain who does that i thought horikoshi was being rushed to finish mha but no apparently not he was just being rushed to get back to the hero school and i genuinely don't know what to do with that information after we covered chapter 423 i figured there was three four more chapters left in this story that we're gonna wrap up the story in a nice little bow and everyone was gonna go oh mha's over now but we got a whole new arc introduced and we gotta talk about it which is why today we're talking chapter 425 of mha explained but before we get to explaining anything guys please for me like this video subscribe to the page and hit that noti bell and if you like the idea of hearing me break down your favorite anime and manga news go ahead and follow my anime podcast at talk anonymous where me and danny mata break down everything that happens in anime and manga this week it's available on youtube spotify and apple podcasts so chapter 425 starts in a way that you would kind of expect an epilogue to start especially when you consider the fact that it picks up exactly where 424 leaves off because for all intents and purposes the first half of chapter 425 starts to close out the story see the chapter opens at the graduation ceremony for the third years from ua where we see nezu the principal of ua giving graduation documents what's the word i'm looking for here diplomas to tamaki and nejere and when nejere gets her diploma all the second and first year boys are devastated because she's not going to be around anymore if you guys don't remember nejere is kind of like the idol of ua we then cut to president mike who is very aptly djing the ceremony and treating it like it's day three of coachella we then get a breakdown of how everybody broke it into their individual years feels about how hype this graduation ceremony is and we're told the graduates or the old third years are getting used to it the the third years the old second years are starting to accept it and the second years the old first years don't know how to feel about it we then see class 1a celebrating for all of the graduates because all of the third years had to wait much longer than usual to graduate from ua but i can't imagine it was like that much longer because it's june i guess in japan they probably graduate in may i think i graduated high school in may but i it's like not that long it's the next month like hey the entire world collapsed and the biggest thing we're worried about is graduation being postponed two weeks we had graduation get postponed because we had too many snow days we then cut to tamaki and nejere as tamaki's checking in with nejere asking if her wounds still hurt and she tells him a little bit but she's so happy that she feels fine now to this point the tamaki reveals to us that mirio kept taking care of the two of them even after they were defeated on top of that flying coffin now the flying coffin the tamaki is talking about is the giant floating ua platform that 
that was meant to make sure that Shigaraki couldn't use his decay. And if you remember, the big three third years were all incredibly crucial in the early parts of the battle against Shigaraki. But even their ultimate moves like Tamaki's Chimera laser attack didn't do all that much. The narrator then kicks in and talks about how the restoration project is going in Japan, telling us that even for a superpowered society, the restoration project is going especially well in Japan because of one man. And I think putting the man in quotation marks here is kind of rough considering the fact that the ending of MHA had an entire arc dedicated to how heteromorphs have rights to. But then again, at the same time, Principal Nezu just simply isn't a man. He was an animal who manifested a quirk and that quirk was super intelligence. I don't know. It just feels weird to put man in quotation marks when we had an entire arc from Annie Voice and Duple Arms being like, we have rights to even though we don't look like humans. Maybe I'm being weird. But anyways, it's revealed that the restoration project in Japan is going especially well because Nezu is putting pressure on other other countries in order for them to help Japan rebuild. Now, it's revealed the reason that Nezu is so incredibly successful in pressuring all these other countries to come and help Japan is because he's a man respected all across the globe for his global contributions to the quirk morality education system. And we're told that the entire time that the battle for Japan was going on, Principal Nezu was looking for what lied beyond the horizon of the end of this battle, aka the restoration. Up to this point that Moatafua comes back into the story, and for those of you who don't remember who Moatafua is, she's kind of a background second year who was vague involved in the battle against All for One, and apparently she is now the representative of the students, as she was a former second year, now raised to a third year. So she gives a speech off screen, we don't see it, and the representative of the third years, Lamillion, aka Mirio, comes up to give a formal response. However, this is the most serious we've ever seen Mirio. He doesn't open the speech with a joke, and there's not an ounce of humor in the entire speech. Well, I guess until the end. But basically, Mirio goes on talking about how a hero's job is to turn my minuses into zeros. That is to say that any battle a hero finds themselves in rarely accomplishes anything outside of stopping negative things that might have come if heroes hadn't stepped in. That is to say that a hero's job is maintenance, to keep society at a base zero. And over the course of the last couple of weeks, if not months, we've been struggling as a school to set society back to zero. And how it's taken effort from everybody in UA, not only just the hero course students, but the general education course, the support course, and the management courses to battle back against society being set into the negatives. And even now, as UA stands victorious over evil, they're still not even back to zero, as the restoration of Japan hasn't yet happened. And thus, Mirio says that the last three years were to prepare us, the third years who are graduating, for what lies ahead, and tells them that their goal will not be reached today, and that a world without humor has no bright future. He then finishes his speech by saying that a world of pluses where everybody can smile is our real finish line. He then throws his hand up in the air and tells Night Eye to watch him as he screams, today is the day we start, and to all of my underclassmen, see you as he gets launched off the stage by what i can only describe as a giant emporio of onkov mask now apparently the graduating representative of students gets launched off the stage as a tradition at graduation at least that's what we're told and this is the first graduation that we've been to as readers so we just kind of have to believe them now all of that very very standard epilogue stuff. The third years are gonna go help with the restoration project or maybe go overseas to help countries that are still being overrun by villains, which means Mirio, Tamaki, and Nezure's stories are wrapped. Good job. But it's after the graduation ceremony that the epilogue starts to take a turn for the less usual, as we now cut to class two, a, where Aizawa is talking to class 1A, that's now 2A, that's gonna be tough to rewire in my brain, and is telling class 2A, well, in a usual circumstance, you would have a different homeroom teacher, because things are unusual right now, you're stuck with me. And everyone's really stoked about that. Why wouldn't you? Aizawa's sick. We then see Bakugo say, well, cool, at least that's settled, at which point Saro goes, shouldn't you be in the hospital? Hey, Saro, he's sitting right in front of you. There's literally no way this is your first time seeing him today. But Bakugo says that he's allowed to go to school so long as he stays calm, which he's actually doing a surprisingly good job at. But after this exchange between Saro and Bakugo, speaking of not being calm, Ioma kicks open the door. And in front of class 2A says, I came to say adieu. 
I'm leaving UA. Now, the majority of Class 2A begins to protest against this, saying things like, but you're the only reason we were able to split up All for One's forces. And Ioma rebuts this by saying that Aizawa and Suchikaki, aka President Mike, have already said that I could stay. Sukauchi, I, I don't know what I said. But Ioma wants to make amends. See, it's revealed that Ioma only ever went to UA because All for One told him to. And therefore, Ioma wants to atone for his crimes and then try to be a hero again later. Then, uh... Gives Deku like a, a cookie. It's like I took my friend's hands after all, and then he just like reaches his hand out and like puts it kind of in front of Deku's face, and there's like a I, I, I don't know what's in it. But Deku's fine with it. He just says, yeah. And then Ioma continues by saying, I'm sure that one day I'll feel pride standing next to all of you. And then everybody gets all bleary eyed and starts screaming about how manly Ioma is. And he starts to shoot naval lasers into the sky. Now, Ioma then continues on by saying that I have a surprise for all of you. And that surprise is a way better replacement student in the form of Shinzo. And almost immediately, everybody has already forgotten that Ioma even existed. As everybody flocks to Shinzo and congratulates congratulates him for joining Class A, asking him things like if he's gotten his provisional license yet. This makes Ioma incredibly upset, and he continues shooting his naval lasers everywhere until eventually one of them hits Haru. Haru, Invisible Girl. Toru. Yeah, it's so close. And as we know from all the times that Toru was able to bend the naval laser or increase its power through her invisible body, this makes her visible, which means for the first time for the majority of Class 1A, everybody sees what Toru looks like, including... Manetta, who falls in love almost immediately, going so far as to say, I didn't know God was amongst us this whole time. And while all that could seem like fairly standard epilogue stuff, the sheer context of the fact that the epilogue is going to continue the story through the medium of Class 2A means that Shinzo being involved in Class 2A now moving forward means that he'll probably get an arc of some sort. And thus his story is one of the first storylines introduced in this epilogue. We'll probably get some storyline resembling the idea of Shinzo trying to live up to the idea that he's worthy of being in class A. We then, after Aizawa chokes out Mineta, cut back to Mawata Fua, who's addressing class 2A and saying that the second and third years will be helping in the Japanese reconstruction project under her leadership. And on top of rebuilding Japan, they'll also be traveling nationwide to help against pockets of villains that haven't necessarily given up the fight yet. AKA, they're doing the Hero Academia. And it's at this point that you have to pull your MHA bingo card because when we started talking about villains, all my or the lack thereof All Might, and therefore the lack thereof a symbol of peace, gets brought up. And it gets brought up in Todoroki's head. As he says, All Might's retirement and the Jaku battle, after these great battles, there's always a moment of grave unrest. A period of chaos that's not so well documented. Todoroki then says, all for one. He was born under similar circumstances. A time when there was no symbol of peace to keep villainy at bay. Moata then reveals to us on her way out of the classroom that Aizawa used to be her homeroom teacher and that Aizawa once made them experience death so that she could understand what being a hero was. We then cut to Deku's good side as he and a good part of class 2A are walking somewhere. Talking about how starting tomorrow, they're gonna be upperclassmen. Ida then chips in and says that things are moving at a crazy pace. But Saro says to quote a certain somebody, at least we got a moment's rest. Now, this is embarrassing to Araka because what Sarah is referencing here is when Araka went on top of UA with her microphone and screamed at everybody to let Deku rest there, even though Deku's presence inherently risked their lives. Deku then tries to use this moment to have a conversation with Uraka, and she, possibly being embarrassed, turns to him and says, et tu, Deku-kun? It's actually in reference to Caesar's assassination, where Caesar, after being stabbed by Brutus, says, et tu, Brutus. It just means, and you, in Latin meaning that in this moment, Horikoshi is making Uraka somebody who's being betrayed by the people closest to her, and when she believes that Deku's about to chip in, Deku becomes her Brutus. And therefore, before Deku can have any meaningful words with Uraka, she looks him dead in the eyes and goes, oh, you shaved your head because of your injury, right? Hope that grows back soon, which is just the absolute kind of thing a woman would say to you that would just chop you down at the ankles. Like, hey... Yikes, hope that's over soon. Oh, I would die for you. That hurt a lot, but I'm gonna smile and laugh. We then cut to Tokiyami, whose hair has become all frizzed up because he was in a big old fire battle. And Sato says to him, you've changed your looks too, Tokiyami. And Tokiyami says that it wasn't intentional. We then cut to Araka laughing and a deadpan stare from Deku that makes him look like the lead singer of a made up girl band. Like he kind of looks like Sony from Sony's Edge in Love, Death and Robots. Anyways, enough with the epilogue stuff. Let's get into 
building an ark. Because after we're done with all the festivities and liveliness, we cut to what the majority of readers are assuming is gonna be our next villain. But Nick, why do we assume that? Well, because we cut to an incredibly dark page where somebody with tears in their eyes and what appears to be a dark mask taped around their face is stumbling through the rubble of Japan. Now, the character design of this person doesn't necessarily scream, I'm a villain, but it definitely screams, oh, things have gone bad for me recently. Because outside of the tears, messy hair, no shoes, and possibly bloody mask, the fingers of this person are also worn down to the last knuckle. Their fingers kind of look like the fingers of a child who just got Got done painting their finger painting masterpiece or Deku after he flicked one too many times back when he couldn't control one for all. Now it appears as though this man is stumbling out of a house and onto the street and therefore in my expert opinion it appears as though the destruction of the final battle maybe shook something loose that allowed for this man to break free which is corroborated by the fact that he is wearing a straight suit. See this seems to be a detail that I feel as though a lot of people are missing. See we can see very clearly that down the entirety of the back of the shirt that he's wearing is ties, which could technically be a hospital gown until you see the fact that also on his left arm appears to be a belt around his bicep. Now, this belt around his bicep might seem like a fashion accessory, but in actuality, it's showing us that what he's wearing is an old-timey straitjacket. Now, it's kind of hard to assess how old this guy is, but my best estimates put him anywhere between Mirio and Aizawa, and that's really all we know about this character, that he's wearing a straitjacket and that he appears to have a mask taped to his face. Now, it's safe to assume that the wounds inflicted on his fingers are most likely from crawling out of wherever he was locked. What I find substantially more compelling out of all of this is the mask, as the mask seems to imply that either he was being silenced so nobody would hear him, or that he has some mouth-based quirk that is being suppressed with the mask. And while it has been confirmed this character in the epilogue is a character we've never seen before in the manga, a lot of people are starting to buy into the idea that this character is actually Deku's father. And now I don't personally agree with this just because the character doesn't seem old enough to be Deku's father, but it is important to note that the only thing that we do know about Deku's father is that he has a fire-breathing quirk, and thus if it was Deku's father, it would make sense if he was institutionalized that they would cover his mouth so that he couldn't breathe fire at all the attendants or possible captors. However, his identity isn't really all that important, as the general consensus about what role in the story he will play is pretty much universal, and that is that he'll serve as a minor antagonist to wrap up the story so everybody in Class 2A can get their happy end, and who Deku can use the final embers of one for all on, making him once and for all quirkless, as we've really been dancing around the idea of Deku being quirkless because while he did technically shoot all of One for All in Dishigaraki, he says that the embers of One for All still exist in him, which is slightly similar to the situation All Might was in in his final battle against All for One. Well, not his final battle against All for One, his final battle against All for One while still being the wielder of One for All. Almost forgot the all Might Iron Man Saga. What a weird story. We then cut back to Deku who's talking to Todoroki, asking him if he's gonna go to Ioma's farewell party. To which Todoroki responds by saying, yeah, so long as it's not today. Now this concerns Deku, who says Todoroki-kun, but Todoroki says don't worry. Todoroki then says all right and begins to make his way in a direction, and it's heavily implied that that direction is towards his father and charcoal brother, who are finally getting some bonding time. Now, that bonding time is Endeavor sitting in a wheelchair, heavily bandaged, sitting in front of what appears to be some kind of medical assistance contraption that's keeping Dobby alive, but bonding time. You know what they say, it's not what you do, it's who you do it with. Thus it appears as though Dobby is still alive. Somehow. And that somehow probably has something to do with the massive amount of medical technology that kept All for One alive all these years. And thus, this is the third storyline introduced through the epilogue. Because this means that Dobby is still alive, which means the Todoroki family either has to pull the plug on him or deal with him waking up and trying to reintegrate him into the family. But considering the fact he looks like a pizza you left in the oven overnight, I can't exactly imagine him waking up. And if he does wake up, I can't imagine him living the greatest life. And thus, not only do we have an introduction of a possible storyline for Shinso, we have a new villain in the story that might be Deku's dad, I highly doubt it, and we have to wrap up the Todoroki's family drama as it pertains to Dobby, which at this point might as well be a reality TV show. So yeah, 
A lot happened for an epilogue. On top of this, MHA, just like JJK, I'm so happy they decided to do this at the same time, is going on an extended break. And genuinely, I cannot blame Horikoshi for that. He literally just finished his story just to start it again. I also would need a breather. But I'm curious to hear from you guys. What did you think of this chapter? And what do you anticipate coming down the pipe in this epilogue? Tell me in the comments below. And why you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Between this JJK and Chainsaw Man, what a roller coaster ride of a week for Mongo.